Established security exchanges enjoy a winner-takes-all advantage, a networking effect. How do you compete? Josh Smith is CEO of NEO, a securities exchange established in 2015. Josh, what is NEO? Uh, well, Michael, first of all, a pleasure to be uh, with you and a uh, pleasure to, uh, to be able to share some thoughts with, uh, with your audience. Uh, what is NEO? NEO is, uh, is, uh, is a new stock exchange and new, you know, we have been operating now for a bit more than, uh, than six years and a fully fledged stock exchange here in Canada, uh, recognized as uh, what we call a senior exchange or a tier one exchange. So if you want to compare us to some of the existing players, you would compare us to the TSX. We're not a venture exchange. Uh, what what makes us uh, unique is that uh, we, we designed the entire uh, exchange on, 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 on a couple of core values. Uh, and what that means is that everything that we do is driven by how is this going to benefit a long-term investor? How is this going to benefit the uh, the capital uh, raises? And it was a bit of an answer to how we have seen exchanges uh, evolving uh, globally and, and, and in Canada, where when they became for-profit organization, the focus, and I can get that, but the focus was how do we maximize shareholder value? And that does not always go together with the best interest of a long-term investor or the capital raiser. Now, I want to get to uh, some of those weaknesses, or you say some of the services that you can provide that the other security exchanges are not. But uh, maybe first, if you could talk about some of the people that are behind Neo. Yeah. So when we came when we came out with that uh, that vision, uh, which was really call it a call for change, a call for innovation, a call for a, a new and different approach, uh, we talked to uh, a number of. Uh, large Canadian financial institutions and uh, we got some some great buy-in and uh, if you look at our shareholder base today what you will uh, notice is that uh, two of the largest pension funds are, are backing NEO. You will notice that the two largest independent mutual funds are backing NEO. You will find uh, players uh, like, you know, uh, your base in Vancouver, BCIM is uh, is one of our shareholders. Uh, you'll find a global player like Invesco. And then you will also find, uh, because these are all institutional investors, you will also find dealers, uh, uh, including uh, RBC, Virtue Financial, uh, bark these, and then also some smaller dealers and some smaller institutional investors with one main uh, item to, to be very aware of, and that was very important for me in the vision paper, the majority of the ownership of NEO is held by institutional investors. And that makes sure that, uh, you know, the, the, the interest of the investor and by definition, the interest of the capital raiser will always be at the forefront of the mind uh, of the minds of our shareholders, and hence our board, and hence our management. What are some of uh, the weaknesses uh, of the current exchange security exchanges, and uh, what uh, services do you think you can provide at Neo? Yeah, when I look at uh, at the exchange world, and, and that's you know an entire revolution that that really started uh, since the the two thousands, I would say that is when that entire transformation took place. You know, from exchanges being owned by members towards exchanges being for profit organizations. But what I've seen as an evolution is a, a focus on maximizing uh, short term profits, and that has led. Uh, exchanges to favor certain types of participants. Uh, you've heard, I'm sure, about high-frequency traders. Uh, I'm not against high-frequency traders. We welcome them. I think they can add tremendous value to the markets. But uh, if you let them go uh, you know, uncontrolled, they can also develop what, what we define uh, as predatory trading strategies. And those will lead to lesser quality of execution for long-term investors. This can lead to lesser liquidity in the markets, in fact, because uh, market makers, who were always a big important uh, element in exchanges to ensure that 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 safety net of liquidity, feel that uh, you know they are being taken advantage of. And what we, for example, did uh, to address some of those concerns is that we built in our trading platform a number of mechanisms, again, not to exclude HFTs, uh, but to prevent certain strategies. There's a speed bump. There's a different way of, of looking at uh, matching priorities. That, you know, We don't have a simple first in, first out order matching mechanism. We take into account the nature of uh, the parties who have orders in the book, again, to privilege a long-term investor. 
Another example is market data. I'm sure you've heard a lot about uh, market data being very expensive and, and Canada is, is, is an extreme. And it's coming a bit from, you know, a concept of of uh, the, the consumer being, you know, having no choice. Uh, the, the, the consumer is held by, by the exchanges because they need to have that data. And then exchanges start uh, to charge exorbitant uh, fees. And, and, and Canada is extreme. And, and I got to say, this is really a TMX uh, phenomenon. Uh, we uh, charge very reasonable market data costs. We don't charge uh, until now, we have not been charging any market data fees for retail investors. Uh, and uh, when it comes to our own listed securities, uh, we have not been charging uh, market data at all. So we are very conscious of that cost, the burden. And uh, we think it is important to make sure that people have access to quality data. On the listing side, you know, call it uh, the third big component of what an exchange does. Uh, what, what we have seen over there is that exchanges became extremely transactional. You know, try to bring someone in, you, you know, you, you, you sell them, you try to convince them, you give them a good story. And then once they are listed, you forget about them uh, and they need help. Uh, what, what we do is uh, we help them during the entire pre-listing process in understanding what is critical to be a successful public listing. But then we also help them afterwards when there are issues or challenges. Let me give you uh, one, one example, uh, short selling. Uh, short selling for me is an issue and I'm not against short selling again, I'm against predatory short selling. And we observe that in our markets. And uh, I can tell you without a shadow of a doubt that we are the only exchange in Canada that uh, tracks and keeps an eye on the trading activity. And when we see patterns that uh, are indicating that there's a form of predatory short selling taking place, I'll put it very bluntly, we report it to the securities regulators and we keep them informed and we provide them data uh, to, uh, to do uh, analysis from their perspective. But we also help companies, you know, that are, uh, you know, not seeing the liquidity developing the right way. We help them with, again, understanding how they can improve that. Uh, there's a lot of companies that go public and, and don't really realize how important it is to have the right mechanisms in place to achieve investor awareness. So we help them with understanding that. And it's the institutional investor, it's the, uh, it's the uh, investment advisor, it's the retail investor. And we suggest parties, partners, you know, that we vetted for them to, to work with, to help them with that. At the same time, we always give them a very strong message. We do not want to see pump and dump, uh, which is another big uh, challenge that you still see in our markets uh, today. So it's it's all about service. It's all about thinking with them on, on how to make them successful. But at the same time, uh, our values always come back. Uh, our values of, of doing what is right for the long-term investor, what's right for the capital raisers, and advocating and confronting uh, bad practices in the market. Where are you in terms of uh, developing an active uh, market of participants? So in both uh, listed companies, as well as people that are trading on it? Yeah, I think we've made great progress, like in those uh, six plus uh, years, uh, you know, we are now close to uh, to 15% of uh, all volume traded in Canada. So 15% of all the volume traded in Canada is taking place in our exchange. And again, I think that that is driven by our focus on quality of execution, our focus on, on liquidity. And then on the listing side, uh, you know, two, two big components, even though a third one came in quite, uh, quite recently. But uh, on the uh, exchange traded fund side, we are now over 100 uh, different uh, ETFs that are listed on EO by, you know, over 20 different manufacturers here in Canada. All the big players are, are, are pretty much uh, there. Uh, corporate side, we are now over 40 corporates, and uh, and I can tell you that the, the, the pipeline is absolutely fascinating. Uh, what what we have ahead of us, so you're going to see, you know, listings uh, in Q4, and uh, we're already building up a great pipeline into uh, 2022. So great progress, and I think driven by all those services we talked about uh, earlier, and then. You know, more importantly, even I would say, because you can talk as much as you want. That's always a challenge when you start a new business or you start something different. You can you can say everything you want, but people want to see examples. They want to see proof points. And we have some incredible success stories on our market, like 
uh, MindMed, uh, a biotech uh, company, uh, Cybin, another biotech company, Greenland Resources, uh, a critical minerals uh, mining company in development phase, which is showing liquidity and activity that uh, you know outperforms what what companies at a similar stage or similar companies at a similar uh, at the similar stage. Uh, experience on other exchanges in Canada. Those kinds of, of, of success stories, of course, are, are, are helping a lot. And, and it just shows you that all the elements I mentioned earlier, if you apply them and, 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 and you, you, know, you really focus on them, uh, enable success and, and, and success for, for our customers. And, and then the, the, the nice part of the story, you know, I always uh, remind people of, of a comment that I made uh, more than six years ago. The, the approach of NEO of saying we are going to do what is right uh, is a bit of, a, of an interesting bet from a commercial perspective because uh, if you do what is right, are you going to be successful commercially? Question mark. Well, I can tell you now after six plus years of operations that the answer is, is yes. And uh, that, uh, that having that approach of always doing what is right is in fact a big differentiator for us uh, in, uh, in, in our value proposition. I believe this year was the year of uh, decentralized finance and uh, certainly blockchain, uh, just being able to look at being able to move uh, more of this uh, onto a shared ledger. What do you see uh, regarding um, DeFi and security exchanges, uh, Joss? Yeah, so I'm uh, I'm a big believer in in decentralized finance, and uh, you know, interestingly enough, uh, it is a it is a sector that is uh, very well represented uh, on the Neo with respect to uh, to listings. Uh, but and and we can come back to that afterwards. But uh, one of the big common denominators that you see around our corporate listings is they're very focused on the innovation uh, economy. But uh, decentralized finance, uh, I'm a big believer in it. I think that uh, you know it. Uh, it is going to radically change uh, the uh, the financial industry. It's not going to happen in the next two years, but you see it steadily growing, developing, and uh, you know touching more and more parts of the financial industry. Uh, you know, it started on kind of with remittance, if you want remittance payments, but you start to see it moving into other services. You see lending in there now. You see some trading taking place uh, over there now uh, and we're going to continue to see that uh, when do i expect to see it in uh, in in our space uh, you know the stock exchange space itself uh, i would say it's still going to take a certain amount of time because we have an entire infrastructure here today uh, which you know uh, operates uh, uh, is integrated in in the entire community uh, you know is is uh, subject to oversight by by regulators and and you know with with everything at the end of the day working well but could it become more efficient could it be more democratized in the future by leverage leveraging uh, decentralized finance yes but the transition from you know that enormous system that that has been in put in place now towards the new world, to be very honest, I think in our space is probably going to take five to 10 years. Now, five to 10 years, uh, you know, it's not that long. It feels long, but it is not that long. So it is something that uh, that we, uh, you know, are looking at, that uh, we are paying a lot of attention to. Uh, we stay very well aware of what's going on in that uh, space. And we're looking at certain areas in, in our business because we do more than just being a stock exchange, but where we can start to use uh, some of those uh, components. And that is a nice way to uh, leverage those new technologies before applying them you know, to what the core business is and, and where we need you know, to see some, some transformation, not only at our level, but also in the entire stakeholder community around us to really fully uh, enable uh, decentralized finance in, in what I would call the capital markets at large. Do you have a business that uh, you benchmark uh, NEO against? Is there somebody that had an exchange or, you know, something that might be in the finance that might have a strategy that uh, you say that uh, is something that uh, works with NEO? I, I think that, uh, you know, when, when, when you look around yourself, uh, uh, and and you know I'm I'm going to stick maybe first to the to the stock exchange space. I I would say no, not not really. I think uh, this this is real uh, innovation that uh, that emerged here in in Canada. You know we had a great group of people uh, uh, around this to, to 
think about the ideas, to come up with the vision, to come up with uh, with the strategy. It all started with uh, with uh, with a white paper, and uh, you know, again, I, I, I said it earlier. Uh, it was a bit of a bet at the beginning, uh, so that means that there was not you know, many examples that we could uh, look at. The, the closest example and that people compared us with at the beginning was uh, IEX in, uh, in the United States, uh, a marketplace that I think was set up a bit uh, earlier than, uh, than us, but they are purely a marketplace. They're not a full-fledged uh, stock exchange, so they provide uh, or they facilitate trading if you, if you want. Uh, we looked at the stock exchange business in a holistic way because we think all of the, the service or all of the business lines in the stock exchange need uh, you know competitive uh, pressure or need a fresh way of looking at it a different way of uh, looking at it now do we see more organizations uh, emerging in other parts of the financial industry which are paying more attention to you know the the, the better interests of a long-term investor uh, yes, I, I think you you see that. Uh, you know, I'm not gonna name anyone over here because if I name someone and I don't name someone else, uh, I'm probably gonna get in trouble uh, immediately after this uh, this interview. But uh, I definitely see that, that there's there's that you know you have that entire ESG trend also uh, that that is developing in the market that's becoming more and more important and and there is a consciousness amongst many institutions that uh, you know, customers of your services, customers of your financial services in, in our case, care uh, about more than you know, just maximizing profit. They also want to do things that are right, right for the environment, uh, right for, for the society. Uh, you know, governance is, is a bit of a different element uh, in, in, in the word ESG. The only thing that you have to be careful about with, with all of that, and that is something that, that we see around us uh, also, <clears throat> there is people who really mean it. And then there's a lot of, call it, uh, you know, when I uh, come back to the word environmental, uh, there's a lot of greenwashing taking place also. And I think, you know, there's work to be done to uh, to separate uh, the, the good from the bad and, and um, I'm, I'm convinced that we're going to see some some interesting initiatives emerging, you know, at regulatory level and and, and at international level, to really start to uh, turn that that entire ESG concept into something that is much more factual, much more clear, and much more reliable. But it is happening. Uh, the consumer wants it. The retail investor wants it. The institutional investor wants it. And uh, I think that's a great thing. And and to a certain degree, you know, we were a bit of a of a, of a of a front runner uh, in that uh, in that area with some of the things and the thoughts that that we had in in, in how we approach things, uh, which are about giving you know long term investors a better experience. And 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 that is you know allowing uh, everyone in our society to to be more successful. That is democratizing, uh, you know, access to the markets, uh, giving everyone a fair chance. Uh, we, we've often used the word, we want to enable fairness in the market because we didn't see enough fairness. Joss, I think that's a nice place to end it. Pleasure, Michael. And uh, uh, I, I hope I left you with some uh, uh, interesting thoughts about uh, who we are and, and what we seek to achieve. And I can tell you that uh, we're not done yet. So expect more in the months and years to come. Thank you. He's Josh Schmidt. He is CEO of NEO. My name is Michael McCray, and you are watching Kitco Mining.